Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. On May 15, 1957, 30-year-old Lawrence Bader decided to go fishing. The Akron, Ohio-based salesman had been having a rough go of it in his business recently, and with three children and a fourth on the way, Lawrence decided he needed an afternoon to relax. He rented a boat and set off on the calm waters of Lake Erie. Three hours after he set off, a brutal storm hit. The next morning, Lawrence's battered boat was found, but there was no Lawrence. The Coast Guard said that the lake had been so rough that no man could have survived after going overboard. Lawrence was presumed dead, with everyone assuming his body would eventually wash ashore. But it never did. But nearly eight years later, a man who looked suspiciously like Lawrence Bader turned up in Chicago, throwing everything everyone thought they knew about Lawrence and what happened on Lake Erie into question. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I'm going to tell you about the bizarre disappearance and reappearance of Lawrence Bader. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. everyone welcome back thank you for joining us once again i'm kona and i'm ethan and we're the husband and wife team behind this podcast each week i typically tell you the story of an unsolved missing persons case ethan doesn't know anything about the case going into the episode and he's here to provide his reactions and questions in real time hopefully asking some of the same ones that you have at home Now, this episode is actually being released on Christmas Day, so I wanted to do something a little bit different. Possibly one that has a happy ending? Of sorts. It kind of depends on how you define a happy. But I will say that it's a little less tragic than most of the cases we cover, but still incredibly bizarre. All right. So now, without further ado, let's get into the mostly solved case of Lawrence Bader. Lawrence Joseph Bader was born on December 2nd, 1926 in Akron, Ohio. When he was 17 years old, Lawrence joined the Navy and, like many young men, went overseas to fight in World War II. I couldn't find out much about his military service, but he did return to Ohio about 18 months later, give or take, maybe two years When he did return, he was able to graduate high school and then enroll in Akron University. His college career only lasted a semester, however, before he either decided to drop out or flunked out and started working at a campus restaurant instead. Is there some debate as to whether he... Yeah, I mean, I've I've read it, but I've read both in different sources. So everything about this guy is a little bit questionable. So I <laughs> really don't know. Either while he was enrolled at Akron University or, you know, when he was working at the campus restaurant, he met a woman named Mary Lou Knapp. The couple began dating and in 1952, they got married. After that, they quickly began having children because, you know. That's what you do back yep, then. It was called a baby boom for a reason. <laughs> By March of 1957, they had three kids at home with a fourth on the way. Wow. Yeah. Larry supported his growing family by working as a cookware salesman for the Reynolds Metals Corporation. Larry loved archery, and he was also a hunter. He was described by a friend as being a, quote, red-blooded, beer-drinking, all-around nice guy who could talk your ear off and you'd love to sit and listen. He was a family man, too, end quote. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> don't really know what to do with that but all right <laughs> well the family man part is uh pretty important um also the fact that you know 
a guy who could talk your ear off and you'd love to sit and listen. I mean, that's kind of a rare combo at times, right? Like usually you have people you'd love to sit and listen to and people who will talk your ear off and they're often not the same person. <laughs> right. So and that does kind of factor into the story a little bit. So it really appeared as though the Baders were living the American dream. They had a growing family, he had a good job, and they had a nice home in the West Hills neighborhood in Akron. But of course, appearances can be deceiving. According to the 1978 book Among the Missing, Bader was $20,000 in debt and hadn't paid his income taxes in about five years. On May 15, 1957, Larry told Mary Lou that he needed to drive up to Cleveland on business. After he was done, he told her he was going to go fishing on Lake Erie. Mary Lou, who again had three small children and was pregnant, said, hey, you know, maybe it would be better if you came home after <laughs> you were done with your business. No, no. Got to hit up that lake. Yeah. Well, he didn't say that. He replied, quote, maybe I will. And maybe I won't. Ooh, yikes. Yeah, well, he clearly opted for won't. After driving to Cleveland, Larry paid some bills, including his life insurance premium, and cashed a check for $400. He then went to Eddie's Boathouse, where he rented a motorboat with oars. Lawrence Kotler, the owner, warned Larry that there was a storm rolling in, but Bader was undeterred. Even though it was hours away from dusk when Larry rented the boat, he insisted that it be equipped with lights. Lawrence also noted that Larry had a suitcase with him. Wait, he had a suitcase when he was renting the boat? That is what the boathouse owner says. Like he took the suitcase on the boat? Yes. Interesting. Right. I so mean, it would make sense that he has a suitcase if he's like away from home on business. Yeah, but he was only, it was like a day trip. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because Cleveland and Akron aren't far apart. Yeah, I don't know Ohio geography at all. Yeah, it's so there wasn't really a reason for him to have a suitcase. Or if there was, well, there definitely really wasn't a reason for him to have it on, on the boat. Because, you know, he was a salesman and I don't know, maybe he could have had like product samples or whatever. Right. But again, why would you take that on the boat with you? In case he runs into somebody that he can sell some cookware to. his wares. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So Larry set off on his fishing expedition and was spotted by a member of the Coast Guard while out on the water. The Coast Guard member also warned Larry of the impending storm, but Larry wasn't concerned. Three hours after his departure, that storm did hit, and it was a nasty one. Larry never showed back up that evening to return his boat, and people began to fear the worst. These fears were seemingly realized the next day when Larry's rented boat was found on the shore five miles away. Okay, five miles away. What was it around? What do you mean? Well, I mean, like, was there like a major highway nearby? Was there, what was the, what was the setting of where the boat was found? You know, I don't know. It, I, there was never any more information that I saw other than it was just kind of, it washed up on shore mm. five miles from where the boathouse was. Okay. I was just curious, like, if there was like a bus station <laughs> next door yeah. or something. Yeah, I don't know. But even that, like, I'm um, just like, why the elaborate ruse of like getting a boat? Like, what? You know what I mean? Like, right? Why not just? Why not just go? Right. I mean, which is why he was immediately presumed dead. But there were some like weird things with the boat. So when the boat was found, one oar was missing, which, you know, makes sense. It was in a storm. Yeah. The propeller was bent and the hull was scratched, which are pretty minor issues. Like the boat didn't have, you know, a hole in it or anything. Like, right. you know, there's no reason that somebody couldn't have stayed in the boat necessarily. But, you know, if the wind came and knocked him out, then. Sure. Yeah. But the boat itself was basically fine. Now, some reports say that the boat was out of gas, while others say that the gas line was cut. Mm, uh, that's two very distinct things. <laughs> I know. <laughs> One makes perfect sense, you know, given right. the fact that he was out in a storm and he could have been unable to get back to shore because, again, the waves and right. the wind and yeah. he eventually ran out of gas. But if the gas line was cut, obviously that cannot be an accident. But why? 
right? right? Like even if he's staging something, like why cut the gas line? Yeah, you wouldn't need to, right? I mean, yeah. like, so presumably he is staging his death in Lake Erie so that his family can collect on his life insurance policy mm-hmm. so that he, I guess, to assuage his guilt for leaving right. the family, he's leaving them a bunch of money. Yeah. But then why cut why right. cut the gas line? And and again, we don't know if that's actually what happened yeah. or if it just ran out of gas. So I don't know. But those are kind of the oddities surrounding the boat itself. So the things missing from the boat were the one oar, Larry, and Larry's suitcase. Mm-hmm. Searches went on for the next two months, but no one was able to locate Larry's body. He was presumed dead, of course, um, but because there was no body, he couldn't be legally declared dead. Mm. And, you know, back to your theory about him staging his death for the life insurance money, that didn't help Mary Lou, you know, on day one because she was not eligible to receive any of that money. So she had to support her four children alone, surviving on monthly Social Security payments. Real quick, though, one thing we should mention Mm -hmm. is for any listeners that are unfamiliar with Lake Erie, it is a great lake, so it's huge. Yeah. Um, And also back then, it was extremely polluted. Like, I think it was in the 70s that the lake caught on fire. Oh, really? Yeah. I I had no idea. Yeah, because of the amount of pollution that was in it, it, the lake actually caught on fire. So, Oh. yeah. So just keep that in mind. Right. So it makes like it's not crazy that they didn't find his body, I guess right. is what you're saying. Yes. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. I hadn't even thought of the pollution aspect of that. So, yeah, for three years, Mary Lou is like trying to support these kids. She doesn't have a lot of money. But in 1960, Larry was declared legally dead. And thankfully, one of the last bills that Larry had paid on that fateful day was his life insurance premium. So once he was declared legally dead, Mary Lou was able to receive that payout, which was a whopping $40,000, which would have been over $430,000 in today's money. Mm, all right. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. In Akron, Ohio, like yeah. that'll get you pretty far, Yeah, even with four kids. But let's get back to 1957. A few days after Lawrence Bader tragically lost his life in a boating accident, a handsome man arrived at the Round Table Bar in Omaha, Nebraska, over 800 miles away from Akron. Nebraska? Mm Mm-hmm. Wait, how, what was the time? About four days. No, oh, there really was a bus stop by that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the they're not exactly sure, It's but it was like sometime between um, the 18th and the 20th. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. This charming stranger introduced himself as John Fritz Johnson, but he went by Fritz. He came in search of a bar job, having just left the Navy after serving for 14 years. Fritz was hired as a bartender and quickly became well-known around town. He was well-liked and eccentric. A fan of classical music and archery, Fritz bought an old hearse to which he added a lounge area in the back. (laughs) What? Yeah, he had like pillows and like an incense burner. (laughs) Oh my God. That's wild. (laughs) It would like go around picking up women and like inviting them to his lounge. Oh my God. His profile was raised even higher when he sat on a flagpole for 30 days as part of a challenge to raise money for a polio charity. I don't even want to know the logistics of how that would work. Yeah, I don't know the logistics of it, but this was definitely a thing back then. And in the 90s. Yeah, flagpole sitter. Yeah, Yeah. like that's that's what this is referring to because people just did this. And yes, I've never truly understood exactly what that entails, like nor do I care to. Like definitely not something I took the time to Google. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think we should. Yeah, doesn't matter. None of my business. In 1959, he parlayed this newfound local fame into a job as a radio personality at KBON. So apparently, um, he would actually, before the whole flagpole sitting thing, he would actually go to the radio station after hours and like, you know, ask if he could use their equipment. And he basically taught himself broadcasting. Mm. And, um, And then, you know, once he kind of got this like local fame, they agreed to hire him. 
Fritz was flying high, and in 1961, he married a 20-year-old divorcee and model named Nancy Zimmer. Okay. Nancy already had a daughter whom Fritz adopted. The couple then went on to have a son of their own. Fritz's career continued to blossom as well. He moved from radio to local television with a job at KETV, eventually becoming the station's sports director. He continued to excel at archery, a hobby he told people that he had taken up to help with the back injury that he had sustained while serving in the Navy. This is quite uh, an elaborate tale. Yes. He was so good that he even started to compete and won many uh, regional championships and even the Nebraska State Championship. And this guy's doing this. Like, he's not exactly keeping a low profile if he wanted a new life. No, he's he's Fritz. He's Fritz Johnson. He doesn't need to keep a low profile. He's a Navy man who is driving around in a hearse and <laughs> being on TV. Yeah. His love of archery eventually led to a second job as a part-time advisor for archery companies. So in that job, he would travel around to trade shows demonstrating their wares. Going back to his roots. By 1964, Fritz was well-established in Omaha with a fantastic career and a wonderful family. He was a local celebrity and pretty much loved by everyone. That year, however, he was faced with a terrifying ordeal, cancer. A malignant tumor was found behind his left eye, and he had to have surgery to remove it. Jesus. Yeah, unfortunately, doctors had to remove the eye as well. Yeah. But the eye patch that Fritz subsequently had to wear really just made him cooler. You know, like not only was he this like eccentric local celebrity, but now he was an eccentric local celebrity with an eye patch. (laughs) While Fritz may have felt as though he dodged a bullet mortality wise, it wouldn't be long before his perfect life would come crashing down. On February 2nd, 1965, Fritz attended a sporting goods show in Chicago on behalf of an archery company. A man from Akron, Ohio, also happened to be at that show. Uh Uh-oh. He was walking around and stopped to watch Fritz's demonstration. Now, it seemed crazy, but this man who was demonstrating archery equipment with a mustache and an eye patch looked just like this guy he used to know, Lawrence Bader. I mean, that idea was crazy, of course. Larry had died years ago in a boating accident, but he couldn't shake the feeling that he knew this man. Wanting a second set of eyes on this guy, he called Suzanne Pika, who was one of Larry's nieces, and he told her that she had to come down to the sporting goods show. When Suzanne got there, she instantly knew this guy was her missing Uncle Larry. She went up to Fritz and said, quote, pardon me, but aren't you my uncle Larry Bader who disappeared seven years ago? End quote. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, I'm sure that's how that went. (laughs) According to. (laughs) Pardon me. I mean, it was 1964. That's how people talked. Puzzled, Fritz laughed her question off and told her that, no, he was Fritz Johnson of Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. But Suzanne was convinced. She was so convinced she was right that she called two of Larry's brothers. Deciding to humor the insistent Suzanne, Fritz spoke to the brothers on the phone. Oh, Jesus. He's really confident. (laughs) Yeah. After this call, the brothers were like, okay, we obviously just talked to Larry on the phone. What is happening? So they flew to Chicago. Fritz agreed to meet up with them. And they got there, took one look at him and was like, Yeah, like, this is our brother. You're Larry. Fritz said that he had never been to Akron, Ohio, and he had no idea who these two men were. Okay. He did, however, tell a reporter, quote, I could recognize that the voice of one of the brothers sounded like mine. And when we saw each other, there was a striking resemblance between one of them and me. End quote. Wow, he's just going all in, isn't he? Yeah. All right. Fritz was so convinced that he wasn't Lawrence Bader that he agreed to go down to a Chicago police station with the two Bader brothers to be fingerprinted. So now, why are they in Chicago? 
Because that's where the sporting good, like the trade show was. Oh, oh, okay. So he voluntarily went down, got fingerprinted by the police. The police sent his fingerprints to the FBI. The FBI compared the prints to Lawrence Bader's naval records. Mm -hmm. And guess what happened? It came back as a match. It did. (laughs) Oh, and... Most of the articles that I read said that they made the match based on the finger- fingerprints, but I did read one article that said that they also tested dental records. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. hmm Despite this seemingly incontrovertible truth, Fritz still denied being Larry, reiterating, quote, I am John Fritz Johnson, and I have never heard of this Bader man until this matter came up, end quote. See, the balls on this guy. Like, he's just, he, he, wow. Isn't this amazing? He called the whole thing an uncanny coincidence. Oh, okay. Uncanny that his fingerprints match this missing person. Yeah. Speaking of the fingerprinting, he told reporters, quote, wouldn't I have to be out of my mind to agree to that if I knew I was Bader? End quote. Mm. Which, I mean, yeah. <laughs> You would. Like, that's a fair point. Yeah. Fritz eventually returned to Omaha and ended up hiring a lawyer. This lawyer posited that the brain tumor and surgery had perhaps affected Fritz's memory. Not only did Fritz claim to have no memory of ever being Larry Bader, but he said that he had clear memories of growing up in an orphanage in Boston and serving in the Navy for over a decade. Two things that Larry Bader never did. Hmm. So basically, this is all going down. The fingerprints match up. Everybody's like, okay, you're Larry Bader. Like, he's a, he admits that he looks like the brother. Right. And he's like, okay, no, I'm not because I have over 30 years of memories of being Fritz, of being hmm. Fritz Johnson. He's like, I remember my entire childhood. Like, I can't be this guy you're talking about. I don't know anybody in Akron, never been there. Raised in an orphanage in Boston, ended up in Omaha. So is he just full of shit? Well, nobody knew. That was the problem. So in an effort to clear up the confusion, Fritz was hospitalized and underwent a variety of physical and mental exams. Fritz stayed in the hospital for 10 days, but doctors were unable to determine that he was willfully deceiving anyone. And this was important because if they had determined definitively that Fritz wasn't suffering from some form of amnesia, he could be on the hook for both bigamy and fraud charges. Mm -hmm. Though he managed to avoid that, things quickly began to fall apart for Fritz slash Larry. While he was still in the hospital, he released a statement saying that since he must assume he was still legally married to Mary Lou that he and Nancy would live apart for the time be- being. Uh, okay. Probably against the advice of his lawyers? And I, I don't know. I mean, again, his lawyers weren't claiming that he wasn't Lawrence Bader, just that he didn't know that he was Lawrence Bader. Mm. And so he wasn't a fraud, you know, in the legal sense according to them, you know, nor should he be charged with bigamy because, like, he wasn't trying to be a bigamist. This is weird. Yeah. Nancy, of course, this poor girl, just gobsmacked by the entire thing Mm -hmm. and was like, I don't know what to think, you know. Um, And she eventually did end up having their marriage annulled because, again, it wasn't legal in the first place. Mm -hmm. So what did Mary Lou, who had lived as a widow for nearly eight years, think of all this? She told reporters that she was married in the Catholic Church and, quote, the church doesn't recognize divorce, end quote. Oh, my God. (laughs) She also said that she wanted a father for her kids and was planning a trip to Omaha when the time was right. What the hell? Yes. So she was literally just like, listen, when I said I do, I meant it. And if my husband's not dead, great. Like, sorry about this other family, (laughs) but I've got four kids I'm tired of raising on my own. (laughs) 
Once news got out that Lawrence Bader was alive, everyone wanted their money back. Mm. The life insurance company, the IRS, and even the boat rental company oh, came calling, sakes. which really? I thought was so Eight years petty. Later. Eight years later, that dude was just like, yeah, I want a replacement boat. <laughs> This was bad news, of course, but it was only made worse after KETV terminated Fritz due to his double life. (laughs) Or alleged amnesia. Or, yeah, whatever it was, they're just like, you know, we're good. Like, we don't really want to be involved in any of this. Take your eye patch and get out of here. Yeah. Fritz went back to working as a bartender, making $100 a week. 50 of that went to Mary Lou, and 20 of it went to Nancy. Yikes. Fritz was left with $30 a week and moved into the Omaha YMCA. You can live in the YMCA? Oh, back then, yeah. That was like what people did when they were down on their luck. Like, they, you can rent a room at the Y. Oh, weird. Yeah. That's the Did whole song, that. YMCA. It's fun to stay at the YMCA. Oh. Not just like go to the gym at the YMCA. <laughs> Look, I don't know. I didn't... <laughs> Didn't listen to the lyrics of that song that closely. (laughs) The point is, is that Fritz fell hard very quickly. Like his life just really went from, you know, being amazing to being terrible in a matter of months. In August of 1965, so all of this happened in February. So it wasn't until August that Mary Lou and her children finally reunited with Larry But he was still insisting that he had no memory of his previous life. Mary Lou told reporters, quote, I am hopeful he will eventually remember. He's convinced himself that he doesn't recognize anybody, end quote. Wow. But she's still married to him. Yeah. So, you know, he was giving her $50 a week, basically like for child support. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I guess because and and he did like, you know, when he was in the hospital, he's like, I guess I'm still married to this woman because I guess I am Lawrence Bader. But, you know, according to him, he had no idea who he was. So he wasn't going to just like go to Akron and move in with her. So he stayed in Omaha, I guess, you know, while he kind of figured out what to do. Hmm. But Fritz never did come around in early 1966. Doctors determined that his cancer had returned, and this time it was in his liver. On September 16th, 1966, Lawrence Bader died, for real this time, just shy of his 40th birthday. Jesus. All of this, both of his lives were before he was 40? I know. Holy shit. I'm turning 43 in a week, and I have accomplished very little compared to this man. (laughs) Yeah, he was busy. A funeral was held for Fritz Johnson in Omaha, and the next day, his body was transported to Akron and buried in a family plot in Holy Cross Cemetery. So what's on the tombstone? Fritz or Larry? Larry. Lawrence Bader. In the fam- in the Bader family plot. But they held a funeral for Fritz also? In Omaha, yeah. He had a lot of friends, you know? They wanted to say goodbye. Yeah, no, I mean, that's kind of nice. Yeah, All things considered. Yeah. I don't know if Nancy attended or their children or what the situation was by that point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he had a he had two services, two names, two services. To this day, over five decades later, no one truly knows what happened to Lawrence Bader on the lake in 1957. Did he plan to fake his own death in order to escape his debts and start a new and radically different life in Omaha? Or did he truly have no recollection of his previous life, either due to an injury sustained during a boating accident or because of this tumor, which, you know, could have been growing at Mm -hmm. that point? Right. If it was the latter, then Larry was seemingly suffering from disassociative amnesia, a rare condition in which a person has no memory of his or her life due to trauma or stress. According to an article on mentalfloss.com about Larry, quote, In a dissociative fugue state, they have an urge to travel and may invent a new personality, settling in a new area with no recollection of how they got there, end quote. That's real? (laughs) Yes. And they talked about this guy um, who disappeared in the early 2000s and was found six months later. He um, 
disappeared from New York and was found six months later, I believe in Chicago in like a homeless shelter. And he had no idea how he got there. But apparently, he was a Vietnam veteran um, who was already, you know, he already had issues due to that. Right. And he was near the Twin T- Towers on 9-11. And so he just like... Snapped? Snapped, yeah. Had a break. Didn't remember who he was. Ended up in a homeless shelter in Chicago. That's bizarre. Yeah. So it is possible. And, you know, the the urge for travel and the new personality, it all fits with, you know... What, what happened? What happened. Yeah. But they do say that it's unlikely that he wouldn't have had any memories come back in like a decade, basically. They said that typically those memories are misplaced, Mm. not lost. Okay. So they usually do come back. So while, you know, again, the human brain's crazy and it's definitely possible that he truly had no memory of being Larry, um, you know, it's also possible possible that maybe something happened and maybe he did have some memories come back and didn't want to admit it. Mm. Or it's possible that he just made the entire thing up and is a giant fraud. Weird. Yeah. And nobody truly knows. There was no way to definitively prove it. And he died before, you know, before they really had a chance. Whether Larry Bader was just a huge fraud or someone suffering from disassociative amnesia for over a decade He was going to die in 1966 regardless. That tumor didn't care what name he was going by. Though the last year of his life wasn't the best, that chance encounter at a sporting goods show in Chicago in 1965 at least gave Lawrence Bader's wife and children a form of closure that the families of people we cover on this podcast often never receive. So that is our bizarre Christmas story for you this year. This is our last episode of the year and the end of season four. We are not going to take our normal longer break uh, during seasons, but we probably will be taking a short break next week and then coming back with brand new cases. Well, you can also expect things to be a little bit different in season five. We had our very first interview with a victim's family this season uh, in the case of Danielle Bell, and you can expect more episodes like that to come up in 2024. So thank you to all of you for listening to us. Thank you for supporting us, whether it's writing a review, sharing, talking about us on Reddit, joining the Patreon, subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts. We truly appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social. And then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and TikTok. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next year for a brand new episode. See you next year. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster Production. Hey, you can do it!